in our organization, we own a lot of old documents. We have about 120,000 documents from before 1812, so documents on black history or church history or military history, whatever. And we've got a lot of original writings from this particular founding father. And one of them is he's got a prayer journal, and, and he's got his memoirs. And it's interesting that in his memoirs, he was going through, and as a Christian, he was trying to be very grateful for God for all the blessings he had. And so as he's going through and listing all these blessings, I'm reading them going, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And, then, and then he gets to the one where he says, and I thank God for all the times I have not fallen down the stairs. What? <laughs> and I started thinking about that. I said, you know, the only time you notice stairs is when you fall down them. If you, if you walk up them and don't fall, nobody notices that. They notice if you fall, what's the blessing? Falling down the stairs or not falling down the stairs? And I got to thinking, you know, have, as many times as we drive the car, we go to the store, whatever, we make it back home, we don't have a wreck, we don't think about it. It's a blessing we didn't have a wreck. If we had a wreck, that's when we notice it, and that's not the blessing. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of things in life that are blessings that we just don't notice until something goes wrong. The blessings of health until something happens. The blessings of a job until something happens. The blessings of family until something happens. It's just things we take for granted. And literally, we live in a nation where we take a whole lot of things for granted. Just to give you an example, even with our government, and there's plenty to gripe about and plenty of things we don't like, plenty of things that need to be fixed. And yet, having said that, if you look at our form of government, and we're one of 195 nations uh, at the UN this year, there's 195 nations. It goes up or down every year, but there's 195. They all have governments. Every one of them has a government. Now, our government, we started, we wrote the Constitution in 1787, and we've had the same Constitution since 1787. Look at all the other nations in the world and compare what it would be like to live in other nations that don't have that kind of stability. For example, France has had 15 constitutions while we've had one. Just look at other nations and imagine the instability. We have so much stability, we just take it for granted. We, we just think it's natural and it's normal, and it's not. I, I was in Poland last year with the congressional delegation and talked to people in Poland. I talked to people in Poland that in their life, they have lived through seven constitutions in their life. If you're a baby boomer from South Korea, you've lived through six constitutions, and we consider South Korea to be a very stable nation. So do you know what the average length of a constitution in the history of the world is? The average length of a constitution in the history of the world is real simple. It's 17 years. Now, we've had ours for 232 years. That's a huge blessing. I mean, that's just... We can gripe all we want about the problems with America. I like not having a new government every 17 years. And by the way, the world average is, on average, a nation averages a violent revolution every generation, and they average a new constitution every 17 years. We've had one for all that period of time. We also have creativity. When you look at where we are with creativity in America, there's a lot of ways to measure creativity, uh, copyright, patent protection, et cetera. But America is 4% of the world's population, and yet every year we produce more technology, more cures, more medical discoveries, more plays, more symphonies, more entertainment, more everything than the other 96% of the world combined. Now, 4% of the world's population should produce 4% of the world's whatever. Not around here. Our 4% every year produces more than the rest of the world. We just take that for granted. I was in Germany last year and went with some military, to some military bases there, doing some military stuff. And while I was there, now I'm a cowboy from Texas. I got the boots to go with it, I got the ranch, got the horses, got the pickup, got everything that goes with it. I'm a cowboy from Texas. So I got to stay at a five star German hotel. And that was really elegant. And it was really cool for a cowboy to do that. And it would have been especially cool if that had internet at that hotel. Now, I'll point out, even Motel 6 in America's got internet. And you got a five-star hotel, you can't get internet. See, there's so many things we take for granted that we don't even think about, and they're blessings. We also have the blessings of productivity. Our 4% of the world's population every year produces 25% of the world's gross domestic product. And America does not produce more because we have greater natural resources, because that's just not true in so many areas. You know, go back to me as a cowboy. That makes me part of the agricultural community. And farmers and ranchers in America, that's only 1% of America's GDP. So 1% of America's GDP, we as farmers and ranchers every year produce enough food. We're number three in the world in agricultural production, even though we're only 4%. We're number three in the world. And as it turns out, 
we're number 66 in the world in percentage of farmable land. There are 65 nations that have a greater percentage of farmable land than we do. But at number 66 in the world, we're number three in the world in production. We take what we have and make it go further than any other nation. So we are blessed in so many ways. Now, here's the interesting part. With all that we do with, with history and, and, and all these documents we have, we have so many textbooks. We got the first textbook printed in America, 1690, printed in Boston. You go from there for the next three and a half centuries, and you just look at textbooks, and it's interesting that in our textbooks, we continually, regularly, generation after generation, told students, students, the reason America is different from other nations is because of the Bible. We specifically said the Bible is what made, and we did this in textbooks. Now, try finding that in a textbook today. And most people, they wouldn't believe you if you said that, that, that America made the, that the Bible made America different. But it's easy to prove. I mean, even the way we talk to one another, the way we use phrases and, and what we call idioms. Do you know there's 257 idioms that we speak to one another on a daily basis that are doing nothing but quoting Bible verses? I mean, it's really kind of interesting. If you happen to be a baby boomer or Gen Y, you'll recognize these. These are all Bible verses. By the skin of your teeth, I'll give you my two cents worth. A leopard can't change his spots. There's nothing new under the sun. Signs of the times. These are all Bible verses. Now, if you happen to be Gen Y or Gen Z, millennial or Gen Z, these are the kind of phrases we've heard for the last 15 years. They're all Bible phrases. They're, they're all quoting specific Bible verses. And it's interesting. One of the things I like doing is when I hear on the news or hear on some TV program or something, somebody quote a Bible verse, I'll write it down, I'll note it, I'll send it to the office, at, you know, ABC at this time on this day did this report and they quoted a Bible verse. I will tell you that over the last two years, the single entity that quotes the Bible more than any other entity quoting the Bible on air is ESPN. Now, they don't have a clue they're quoting the Bible, <laughs> but they use these things, oh, LeBron's going to take us to the promised land. There you go. There's a Bible verse. So we get, we get all these phrases all the time, and people don't recognize. So if you want to have fun, next time you go to the gas station or you go to Walmart or you go to McDonald's, you go to Macy's, you go wherever, you're going to hear somebody use one of those Bible phrases because we use these all the time. And if you want to have fun, stop them and say, do you know what Bible phrase you just quoted? And they're going to look at you like you're crazy. But the problem is they're going to say, no, I don't. What Bible phrase was that? And we won't know either. You know, we don't have a clue where this stuff came from. Every one of these has a specific address to it. I mean, you can track every one of these back and read the Bible where that this is language that came directly out of the Bible. I think where America is today is well described by President John Quincy Adams who said this. He said, with regard to the history contained in the Bible, it's not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it as it is shameful to be ignorant of it. You see, America's had a cultural default in the last generation or so. Back in, the previous, in their generation, if you did not know that stuff came out of the Bible, they'd look at you and say, whoa, how can you call yourself an educated person and not know the greatest book in the history of the world? You didn't know that came out of the Bible? You're kidding me. Today, if you'd known that stuff came out of the Bible, we'd praise you. say, that's unbelievable. You know the Bible that well to recognize those phrases. See, we've had a cultural shift where the today to know the Bible is praiseworthy Back in their generation, not to know it was shameful. Uh, another quote, great quote from uh, President Teddy Roosevelt. And by the way, I'm going to use presidents for the next few minutes because I want you to see that for 150 years, it was the presidents of the United States who carried the water on the Bible in America. It was the presidents who were continually reminding the people, hey, the Bible's what made us what we are. If we're going to be a great nation, we've got to have the Bible. I mean, the president's doing this? Yeah, and I want you to see that. Teddy Roosevelt, this is what he said. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and so entwined with our civic and social life. Notice he did not say spiritual life. We all know that. He said, no, no, no. The Bible's so much a part of our social and our civic life that it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if these teachings were removed. If you take what the Bible has bruised out of America, you wouldn't recognize America. Huh? Let me give you an example. This prosperity that I was talking about that we enjoy here more than any other nation in the world. As a matter of fact, people, according to census data, people who live in poverty in America live higher than middle class in Europe. And that's not facetious, that's not hyperbole, that's not rhetoric, that is actually the truth. Uh, the World Bank says it's a global standard for poverty. The World Bank says if you live on $2 a day or less, you live in poverty. Right now, 25% of the world lives $2 a day or less. That's $730 a year. In poverty in America, we consider poverty level for a family of four to be $41,000 or, or below. So $41,000 versus 720 
our poverty level is completely different from the rest of the world in, in so many areas. So I'm not, not at all condoning poverty or saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying that. I'm saying our level is so much higher than where the rest of the world is, even with something like that. Uh, if, if you happen to be in Hawaii, if you happen to be in Mississippi, both of those states say you should not get a job and come off welfare unless you can make more than $61,000 a year because that's what you're given in benefits if you're in poverty. So you look at that and say, wow, that's an economic system that's totally different from everywhere else. That's part of the free market economic system. Now, what people don't recognize today is the free market economic system that's produced all this wealth and prosperity in America is the result of five Bible verses. Historically, it came from 1 Timothy 5, 8, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, came from Matthew 25, Luke 19, and Matthew 20. People today in economics say, well, Adam Smith, he's the father of economics. In 1776, he did the two-volume book, Wealth of Nations, and that's where we got the free market system. No, America had the free market system fully in place 100 years before he wrote that book. What he did when he wrote that book was just take what was already happening and talk about it. So we had that free market system. We were prosperous, so different from every other nation even back then. If you took out the free market system out of America, you wouldn't recognize us today. We'd be a totally different nation, but nobody recognizes that came from the Bible. Same with our form of government. There are seven different human forms of government you can look at. America chose what's called a Republican form of government. That means we choose elected representatives to, to, to we choose representatives we elect representatives that will represent us in legislatures. Now, that's unusual, especially at the time we did this 200 and some odd years ago. Everybody had a king. You had the king of France, king of Spain, king of Portugal, the Helvetic kings. Everybody had a king, king of Italy, not us. We did it different. And the guys who wrote that into the Constitution, by the way, Article 4 of the Constitution says we can never become a democracy. That's one of the seven forms of government. We have to stay a republic. I have a republican form of government, very different from a democracy. And they specifically said the reason we want a republic is Genesis, is Exodus 18:21, Deuteronomy 1, 15 and 16, Deuteronomy 16, 18. That's where in the Bible, before they had kings, before there was King Solomon or King Saul or King David, the Bible says, choose out from among you leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. Have elections. Elect your local, county, state, and federal people. The Bible says choose able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. So not only do we have elections, we're told the kind of people we ought to be electing to office, and that's what we wrote into our form of government. So our form of government, if you took elections away from America, you would not recognize us. Now, so many nations have elections now, not when we were doing this back at the beginning. We pointed to the Bible as the reason we did it, and we broke the, the tradition of what was going in Europe, what was going in South America, what was going elsewhere. So you see, so many of our things that we have today come from the Bible. We just don't know that today. There's a, a quote also from Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt says, in the formative days of the Republic, the directing influence the Bible exercised on the fathers of the nation is conspicuously evident. He said, we cannot read the history of our nation with of the rise and development of our nation without reckoning the place the Bible is occupied in shaping the advances of the republic. So he's saying there's no way you can read American history without seeing what the Bible did. Now he's wrong because look at any textbook today and you will not see what the Bible did. You can definitely read American history today and not see anything about the Bible or any role that it had in early, but old history books always had the Bible in there. It's interesting, if, if he's saying the fathers of the republic you know, that was his first part of the quote, the Fathers of the Republic Bible influenced them. Let me just give you an example. Let me, let me take Ben Franklin, because Ben Franklin certainly is one of the least religious of the founding fathers. We have about 200 folks, 250 folks we call founding fathers. He's one of the five least religious. But Franklin is the first guy ever to call for the United States of America. Way back in 1754, he said, let's not be 13 colonies, 13 nations. Let's be one nation. Let's be the United States. Didn't happen, but 22 years later, He's one of the 56 guys who signs the Declaration of Independence trying to make us a nation. Seven years later, he's one of only three guys who signs the peace treaty to secure us as a nation. And then four years later, he is sitting at the Constitutional Convention helping create the United States of America. He's been wanting this for 33 years. This is a big deal in his life. This is his life dream is to, is to have the United States, and now he's helping create it. And by the way, this is Ben Franklin right here. He's the white-haired guy in the middle. He's 81 years old at the convention, and that's not impressive today because the average lifespan in America today is 80 years old. So he's a little bit older than average. That's today. When they signed the Constitution in 1787, the average lifespan in America was 33 years old. So just for grins, if you happen to be a high school senior 
and you're here this morning, and you had been alive back then, you would have already had your midlife crisis. Because uh, <laughs> when you hit 18, it's more than half over. You're sliding from 18 on down. <laughs> we just don't think this way. Nonetheless, here's Franklin, 81. And so he's, he's wanted this, but it's not going the way he wanted. Because it turns out, as the states got together at the Constitutional Convention, they had their own agendas. You had the New York plan and the New Jersey plan, the Connecticut plan, the Virginia plan. Virginia didn't want New Jersey's plan. New Jersey didn't want Connecticut's plan. Connecticut sure didn't want New York's plan. So what happened? Everybody had their own agenda. And after five weeks at the Constitutional Convention, it is literally falling apart. Alexander Hamilton said, see you guys. I'm out of here. I'm tired of all the fighting and bickering. George Mason from Virginia, bye. I got better things to do with my time than fight with you guys. So they're leaving and at that point is when Franklin gave the longest speech he gave at the Constitutional Convention. It's on Thursday, June the 28th, 1787. I want you to see what Franklin told the other delegates as this thing is falling apart in front of his eyes. This is his life dream. He said, gentlemen, in this situation of this assembly, groping, as it were, in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we've not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? He said, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. See, this is the room in which 11 years earlier they signed the Declaration of Independence. And back then, we did a lot of praying. Uh, there were Congress was made up of only one body. It didn't have a house and Senate, it's just a unicameral body. But we had three chaplains. And so we did a lot of praying. And by the time you get to 1815, there had been 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America by 1815. So we did a ton of praying. He said, guys, don't you remember what we students? We prayed all the time. He said, our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. He said, all of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? He said, I have lived, sir, a long time, and indeed he had. He said, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of man. He said, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel, and we should become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. He says, I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers employing the instances of heaven and its blessings in our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. May I point out that's not bad for your least religious founding father? He just chewed the other guys out for not praying enough. But here's what I want you to see. That little speech you just saw was 14 sentences long. Now, in those 14 sentences, here's the question I got. How many Bible verses did you just see Ben Franklin quote? The answer is 14 Bible verses. These are the Bible verses that Ben Franklin just quoted. Now, if you had recognized those 14 verses, we would be praising you. you said, that's unbelievable. You knew the Bible that well. See, that's today. Back in their day, even the least religious founding father knew the Bible that well. Even the least religious. See, that's the thing where there's praiseworthy today, but it was shameful back then not to know the Bible. That's the default that's happened. You see it with Franklin. By the way, the rest of the story is after Franklin gave the speech, they had discussions on what to do. Uh, George Washington reports part of what they did. He said that they took three days off. They went to church, and they listened to patriotic orations at church. Uh, the Reverend William uh, Rogers prayed over them. And I've actually got the actual prayer that William Rogers prayed over the Constitutional Convention. Pretty cool. He had the whole, church, he had the whole Constitutional Convention sitting there in front of the church, and he prayed over them. And it's not the kind of prayer we would have to open a city council meeting or something, a dinky little civic prayer. His prayer was so significant, they printed it on the front page of the newspapers of the day. And on the front page of the newspaper, his prayer over the Constitutional Convention was three-fourths of the front page. I mean, it was a serious prayer he prayed. And so after that time of three days off and going to church and patriotic orations and getting special prayer, when they came back, delegates like Jonathan Dayton said the whole atmosphere had shifted. In other words, what was really a stupid idea last week is, the more I think about it, it's not that bad. And so they started making progress after all this stuff of falling apart. And so they get back together, they start on progress, and 10 weeks later, 
they come out with the Constitution of the United States, the most successful Constitution in the history of the world. Almost did not happen. Those three days, things turn around, and then they do it. Now, today, if you know the Bible and if you read the Constitution, you find Bible phrases in the Constitution, and you find all these Bible concepts and Bible ideas there. Now, they didn't put Bible verses beside it because, again, everybody knew it back then. Today, we look at that and say, ah, oh, the, the Constitution is a secular, godless document. Look, when somebody tells me the Constitution is a secular or a godless document, what they've actually done is they've just told me that they are biblically illiterate because they wouldn't recognize a Bible verse if it bit them in the ankle because it's throughout. You find these Bible verses throughout. We just don't recognize it today, and they didn't feel a need to have to tell everybody back then. But again, you can look at the Bible verses, pretty significant stuff. So you look at what happened, and it was so obvious that even for a president like Andrew Jackson, who he's one of our least religious presidents, it was a no-brainer even for him. He said, the Bible is the rock on which the republic rests. And President Zachary Taylor, Zachary Taylor was a war hero. His nickname was Old Rough and Ready. This is what Zachary Taylor said. Zachary Taylor said, the Bible is the best of books. I wish it were in the hands of everyone. It's indispensable to the safety and permanence of our institutions. He did not say our faith. He said our institutions. It's interesting that the more you look at our institutions, the more secular they become, the less well they operate. The more secular education becomes, the more the scores go down. The more secular economics becomes, the more we have corruption. The more secular government becomes, the less well it works. The more secular judiciary becomes, the less you get justice. I mean, all this stuff, the more secular it becomes, the less well it operates because God had principles for all this stuff. So that's what he points out, but he continues. He said, especially should the Bible be placed in the hands of the young, it is the best school book in the world. I would that all of our people were brought up under the influence of that holy book. Best school book. He can't say that. That's unconstitutional which is the great irony. We've had the same First Amendment since 1791. We've not added any new religion clauses to the Constitution. And for all of nearly two centuries, it was fine to have the Bible in schools. It's not now. Not that we've changed the Constitution, but we can't do it anymore. Why is it that we had the Bible in schools for nearly two centuries? Well, it's because we knew our history. You go back to someone like Benjamin Rush. We talked about him earlier. Benjamin Rush, in addition to all that he did, is also known as the father of public schools under the Constitution. He's the guy who said, all right, now that we're no longer 13 nations or 13 states, we're one nation, what are we going to have to do to stay a nation? And in March of 1791, he came out with this piece that gave a dozen reasons why we would never take the Bible out of public schools in America. And by the way, he started five universities. Three of them still go today. He's the first professor of chemistry in the United States, wrote the first chemistry textbook, started academic education for women, education for black Americans. I mean, what he did as a pioneer in so many areas of education, unbelievable. But here he says, we'll never take the Bible out of schools. That's what will keep us a nation. So much did so many founding fathers write about that, that when you get to 1844 in a case called Vidal versus Girard's executors and a unanimous Supreme Court decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Philadelphia has the government-run school and it's not going to teach the Bible? I said, no, no, no. If you're going to be a government-run school, you will teach the Bible. We're not going to have any government-run school that won't teach the Bible. A unanimous decision? Now, by the way, all of you did study that case in your American history textbooks, right? Y'all saw that one? No, don't think so. See, we had all this heritage and history for nearly two centuries, and then it all changed. And it all changed in a case in 1963. That case in 1963 was called Abbott and Shemp and Murray Corlett. In that case, the Supreme Court for the first time said, hey, this deal we've been doing for two centuries, I have in the Bible schools, we're not going to do that anymore. Now, these are the guys who gave us that decision. And and by the way, they said in their decision, they said the decision to remove the Bible from schools was without historical or legal precedent. Wait a minute, did did you just say that you took the Bible out of schools without any historical or legal basis? Yes, we did. Why did you take it out? This is where you read the case. This, This year I'm involved in my ninth case at the U.S. Supreme Court. Every time we want to know what the Supreme Court says, we read the decision and it tells you why they did what they did. If you read that decision, you find this statement. If portions of the New Testament were read with that explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the child. Wait a minute. The Bible causes brain damage, and you're now going to save Americans from brain damage by taking the Bible out of schools? 
I would argue America has suffered massive brain damage since we've taken the Bible out of schools. I mean, we, we've lost our brains in so many areas. But nonetheless, this is what the court says. So you, you look at that. Dr. Rush, way back 1790s, he said very simply, he said, the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. And by the way, we do a lot of national polling. We know this to be true. The younger you are when you start reading the Bible, the more likely it is to be a life habit all the way through. If you start when you're four, five, and six going in school, first grade, kindergarten, it'll stick with you. You can start when you're 14, 15, 16, but it's a little harder to make it a lifetime habit. You can start in your 20s or 30s or 40s. But the older you get, it gets harder. You can start in the 80s and make it a lifetime habit. You have to work at it a whole lot more. So this fact that if you don't study at schools, it rarely... You rarely get it the rest of your life. It's why today we have such a high level of biblical illiteracy. Now, the Bible applies to every aspect of life. As a matter of fact, everything that's popping up on the screen here is something that has been in the news in the last 24 months. That's why I chose these titles. Every one of these titles that's popping up here, the Bible specifically addresses that issue. Whoa, there's no way the Bible talks about gap, capital gains tax. Yes, it does. It doesn't call it capital gains tax. It talks about taxes on profits. The Bible also talks about the estate tax. The Bible also talks about capitation taxes, progressive income taxes, etc. All that stuff's in the Bible. See, as Christians, we should be able to look at anything in the news and say, oh, that, that's crazy. Here's what the Bible says about that. That's what they could do back in previous generations, but we don't know the Bible in the same way anymore. And so that's why we say, oh, that's secular stuff. We do spiritual stuff. No, God spoke to every aspect of life. You know, God built a nation called it Israel. When he gave Israel the laws, he gave them 613 laws. The 613 laws covered everything from military to immigration to education to taxation. You name it, he built one of the most successful nations in the history of the world and did it with 613 laws. So God's word addresses every aspect. It addresses things like abortion, addresses all sorts of things. Even transgender issues are addressed very clearly in the Bible. Things we struggle with today, the Bible dealt with a long time ago. God made it real clear. So within this framework, it's interesting to me that Benjamin Rush, again, 200 years ago, said... The Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in his present state than any other book in the world. See, that's back when we believe the Bible applied to every single thing in life. Let me just give you some examples. This guy's a guy named Matthew Mari. Matthew Mari, we used to study all the history textbooks. We don't study much anymore, but he's called the father of oceanography. What he did is he's the guy who discovered that there were jet streams in the ocean that if you'll move your ship over here about 50 miles and get here, you'll get to Europe about a week and a half faster than all the other ships, which is huge for commercial purposes, for everything else. And so he did, now, you need to understand, he did this in the early 1800s. No satellites, none of the technology. How did he find the jet streams? How did he even know they were there? And, and by the way, pr pretty fascinating. He, he grew up, uh, he grew up, early 1800s, listening to Thomas Jefferson and listening to James Madison, these founding fathers. When he was a single-digit kid, he went to school. He went to sea as a cabin boy. Loved sea. He stayed on, became a sailor. Loved it, stayed on, became an officer. Stayed on, became a ship's captain. Stayed on. He owned his own ship. Stayed on. He owned a bunch of ships. He loved the sea. That was his whole life. He was ashore one day and got in a stagecoach accident and crushed his leg. And it never grew back right, so he was never able to go back to sea because he couldn't keep his balance, couldn't walk right. But he studied the sea. And what happened in this particular case, he was homesick one day, and he asked his family to read the Bible to him. And so what happened is they were reading out of Psalm 8. And this is what they were reading to him. And out of Psalm 8, the Scripture says, "'Lord, thou madest man to have dominion over the works of thy hands.'" Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Read that again. And see, what jumped out of him was paths of the sea. He'd been on the sea his whole life, and he'd never seen paths in the sea. Now, of course, if he'd watched Finding Nemo, he would know that there were paths in the sea, because we've got these ocean currents. He's the guy who discovered that. He said, well, read that again. And they did. And he said, no, no, slow down. Read it again. And he had them keep reading it and reading it. And they're going, we just read it to you. Read it again. He said, if God said there's pathways in the sea, I'm going to find the pathways in the sea. 
And that's when he started looking, and that's when he started finding, if you want to go from Europe to South America, if you want to go from South America to Australia, and he mapped out these pathways and unbelievable stuff back for, again, a time with not the technology we have. But he didn't just stop there. There's another Bible verse that was significant to him. is Ecclesiastes 1.6. Ecclesiastes 1.6, the Bible says, the wind goes toward the south, turns around to the north, the wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. Wait a minute, the wind has patterns? Yeah, found out that in one hemisphere it goes one direction, the other hemisphere it goes the opposite direction, started mapping all that. He's the guy who discovered that there were jet streams in the air. Now, again, we're talking technologically. Think about where he is in the 1800s. He discovered jet streams in the air, and because of that, for the first time ever, weather prediction became possible. He's known as the father of naval meteorology. He said, guys, see those clouds right there? You do not want to sit sail this week because here's what's going to happen. If you'll wait till next week when... We're predicting the weather? Yeah, back then. And it's all in the Bible. It's interesting. This guy had such an impact on science that we built monuments to him all over the United States. There's, there's great monuments to him, great recognition of him. Uh, this happens to be a monument to him in Virginia, big monument. And if you get up close and look, right there is the Bible. It says Holy Bible on the back of it. That's a source of his ideas. That's where he drew his knowledge and inspiration. So here's here's this... And I have, in, the, in the summertime, we take 18 to 25-year-olds, college students, and, and we do two weeks with them, and we just take them through all the scientists. You know, if I, if I took you through, for example, Harvey, who discovered blood flow, blood circulation, he's the guy that back in the 1700s found out the arteries go one way, veins go the other, and there's little flaps inside the arteries and veins that keep it from backing up. And he said, here's what the Bible says. He looks to the Bible, and he points that out. And then you've got Mendel, who's the father of genetics, who said, here's the Bible. Actually, he was a Catholic priest studying the Bible against genetics. And then you get people like Max Planck, the, the quantum physics guy. I mean, I take you through all these scientists and how they use the Bible today. We just know they found this stuff. They don't know, we don't know how they found it. Go back to their story, and they tell you how they found it. Let me take you to another guy. This guy is John Adams. Uh, the constitutional form of government has lasted 232 years. Probably the biggest reason it has is what's known as separation of powers. Separation of powers. Now, there were always three branches of government. Isaiah 33, 22 tells us three branches of government. What we did in America is say, yeah, there's three branches of government, but we need to keep them separate, and we didn't make sure that there are checks and balances so that if the president goes crazy, he can't ruin all the branches. If the court goes crazy, they can't ruin all the branches. If Congress gets out of line, the other. So we always had these checks and balances. Now, that's unique. No nation had ever done that before we did. We came up with checks and balances, and John Adams said that they got it out of Jeremiah 17.9. He has three writings on where they, they found this. And actually, Jeremiah 17.9, it says, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And they said, you know, man's pretty depraved. He doesn't naturally do the right thing. He does the wrong thing, and we need to plan on that because if you have a king like King George III, even if you had a British Bill of Rights and a British court system, the king screws it all up, and it's all bad. And so that's where they got this. And you'll find that not only did he talk about Jeremiah 17, 9, John Quincy Adams did. You'll, talk, you'll also find James Madison, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton. That's what they point to. That teaching in Jeremiah 17, 9 is what they point to as the reason that we have constitutional separation of powers, which is what's made us last longer than any other nation. You also have people like James Kent, who's the father of American jurisprudence. He's the guy who helped put our original judicial system together. And we have in America what's called circuit judges. Now, people don't know that today. And, you know, they're circuit courts. You know you've got that in the state and in the federal. But the original Supreme Court, they were all circuit judges. They all got on their horse, and they rode a particular circuit. Today, they still ride a circuit, but it's electronic. See, the, the, the Supreme Court justices all have a circuit today, the Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit. They all have a circuit. So they still are circuit court judges. But the whole concept of circuit court judges is pretty different. Other nations don't do that same thing. Why did we do it? Well, he points to 1 Samuel 7, 15 to 16. It says, Samuel was a judge over Israel, and he rode the circuit from Gilgal to Mizpah. He got on his mule and rode the circuit. He said, that's what judges did in the Bible. That's what judges need to do in America. So that's why we have a circuit court system. It comes out of the Bible. You also have individuals like Ben Franklin, who started the first health care system in America, started the first hospital in America, the Pennsylvania Hospital, 1751. Why would he start a hospital and a health care system? Well, he cites actually Luke 1035 is the reason he did so. That's actually the motto he put on the hospital. If you go in the hospital today, go in the old door, you'll find the motto right there that Franklin put. This is why we have health care. This is why we do hospitals. You have Alexander Hamilton, who specifically cites Exodus 3118 as the reason that we have a written constitution. 
Now, written constitution isn't what everybody was doing in that day. To this day, Great Britain still does not have a written constitution. We didn't separate from Great Britain and say, let's do what they did, except we'll do it right. They didn't even have a written constitution. We have a written constitution, and they cite Exodus 31, 18. And by the way, James Madison cites the same thing. I mean, there are so many other specific verses I can point to where they cited the verse as why we have this particular trait in America, traits we still have today, we just didn't know where they came from. By the way, if this stuff is of interest to you, uh, over in, in the chapel store, uh, the campus store, there is what's called the Founder's Bible. And this is the Bible. It's, it's a Bible, New American Standard Bible, but it takes the Bible verse that shape particular traits in America across four centuries and shows you how that Bible verse built really the nation that we've just come to take for granted. Uh, there's another book over there that's, that's called This Vicarious Moment. It shows what individually we can do to make a difference in the country. So those are over at the campus store if you want them. But you see, the problem we have in America today is very simple, and it's just summed up in this picture right here. We just don't know the Scriptures very well anymore. Um, it's interesting. National studies right now show that only 14% of Christians read through the Bible on a daily basis. Only 14% of Christians read the Bible daily. Now, I started with John Quincy Adams. I want to finish with John Quincy Adams. Going back to John Quincy Adams, in 1848, a book came out from John Quincy Adams that showed 10-year-old Americans how to read through the Bible from cover to cover once every year. You can imagine what would happen today if a president wrote a book showing 10-year-old Americans how to read the Bible cover to cover once a year. That's what happened back then. It was such a popular book. It went through so many editions so quickly because everybody in America wanted their 10-year-old to see, hey, here's what the president says when reading through the Bible, cover to cover once a year. And this is what John Quincy Adams explained to 10-year-olds back then. He says, no book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated on as the Bible. He says, I myself for many years have made it a practice to read through the Bible once every year. And by the way, if that's not your practice, let me challenge you this morning Make that your practice. If you've never read through the Bible from cover to cover, make a commitment. This morning it says, you know, 12 months from now, when, when we get back 12 months from now, I'm going to have read the Bible from cover to cover. Now, this is what he's recommended for all, all students. And by the way, this is a real common practice in America back then. It's what we did in schools, etc. So he's saying, read through it cover to cover. I do it once a year. He was 70 years in public life. Not only was he president, he was secretary of state, foreign ambassador to five different nations. He was a U.S. senator, 17 years in the House of Representatives, appointed and confirmed U.S. Supreme Court, turned it down because he was ending the War of 1812. I mean, the guy's unbelievable. 70 years in public life, and he says, I read through the Bible every year. And by the way, if you have already read through the Bible before, read through it again the next 12 months. Uh, but I've read through it a dozen times, make it 13. One of the founding fathers, Elias Boudinot, who signed the, the peace treaty in the revolution, he said, I've read through the Bible more than 50 times. He said, every time I go through the Bible, I see things I've never seen before. And that's true. That's why the Bible calls itself unsearchable. You will never get to the bottom of the knowledge that is in that Bible. Every time you go through, it's like digging away, to, uh, like peeling an onion. You get deeper, deeper, and deeper, and deeper. You just unpeel it every time. And that's what they did. So here's what John Quincy Adams explains. He says, my custom is to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from bed. It employs about an hour of my time. Seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning the day. Don't be intimidated because if you want to read the Bible from cover to cover once a year, you don't have to read four to five chapters a day. You don't have to spend an hour of time. To read the Bible cover to cover, it takes 3.2 chapters a day. It takes about 15 minutes. And there are so many apps now that actually read it to you. As I was getting ready this morning, coming, uh, I was brushing my teeth, combing my hair, had the Bible app going. It's reading me the chapters for the day. I mean, it's real easy to do. There's no reason not to be able to go through the Bible in a year, 15 minutes a day. Now, he spent an hour a day because he loved God's Word, and he got into it, and he kept notes, and his diary and his memoirs, a lot of fun to read what the Lord's showing him. Nonetheless, he's talking to 10-year-olds, and he says, now, I've always endeavored to read it with the same spirit, which I now recommend to you. 10-year-olds, listen up. Here's the way I read the Bible. This is why I think you should read it. He said, I've always endeavored to read it. I always read it with the intention and desire that it may contribute to my advance in wisdom and virtue. When I read the Bible, I'm not looking to get blessed. This is not a spiritual blessing. I'm looking for something that will change my life. I want something that will change the way I think, my wisdom. I want something that will change the way I act, my virtue. I'm always looking for application, which is why they find it applying to judges and applying to economics and applying to government, applying to education, applying to immigration, applying to military. They apply to everything because they're always looking for practical application. That's the way to read God's Word. Take and get into God's Word and look for stuff to apply. It is revolutionary the amount of wisdom that's there, 
God knows how to build nations. He built a great one. We use his principles to, to get you know as, as many warts as we have on our nose in America. Now, we got less warts than other nations, but my gosh, no one's been anywhere close to what we've been able to accomplish, and so much of it goes back to people who would apply God's Word. And again, we had blemishes, and we didn't do everything right, no question. But there's a great promise God gives in Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8, God says, if you will constantly think about my Word every day and every night and be sure to obey it, then you'll be prosperous and successful. And I would argue that America has been more prosperous and more successful because more than any other nation, we tried to take and apply principles in so many areas, and that's why it's worked for us. Again, we're not perfect, but we've done more than other nations have. Now, if you as an individual will make that, if I'll get in here, and I'm going to be in it, and I'm going to apply His work, you'll be prosperous, you'll be successful. That's the guarantee God gives us. So I challenge you, take God's Word, start applying it in a very real way, but get into it. Go through it from cover to cover once a year. God bless you guys.